Okay, so the title of my talk is, Can We Avoid Penetrating Radiation? And this seems like a rather generic uh, title. It's just, this is such an obstacle on almost every theory. I've talk, spoken to many theoreticians, and they all say, oh yes, my theory avoids radiation. And then I point out that the actual reactions, which they did not consider, which the theory pr um, predicts, and um, I don't get a very clear answer. And I find this so sa unsatisfactory, I thought I would explain why in a presentation. And so I think, unlike David's very diplomatic, um, very diplomatic talk, uh, compromising between being engaging and irritating, I am definitely going to fall on the irritating side. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick summary of what kind of radiation constitutes penetrating. Well, we all know that neutral particles, particles in the uh, quantum mechanical sense, like photons, neutrons, neutrinos, are not going to interact with matter very much, uh, and uh, therefore they pass through the apparatus and in theory, not in the case of neutrinos, of course, um, uh, are going to uh, carry off the energy. This really has two effects. First of all, we can't quite correlate heat with uh, the energy of the nuclear reaction. And secondly, uh, in many cases, radiation, radiation will be of such a level as to kill the experimenter. Let's be quite clear about that. Just a few watts of, of, of gammas are going to be very, very dangerous. So the question is, why don't we see these penetrating radiation? In fact, the question of what we don't see is so fundamental, it is an observation in itself, a very important observation. For example, what about new, um, tritium? If we were to form tritium at any kinetic energy, which is essential because all nuclear reactions are, have to be exothermic, any kinetic energy above, say, 10 kilo electron volts, I'm sure um, Tom Clayton will uh, confirm this, you're going to expect prodigious numbers of 14.1 mev neutrons. Nobody has detected them with the possible exception of the Spawa group. And I would, I'm not so clear, I'm not so con convinced that this is actually a correct interpretation of the results. So the problem is, how do we get tritons with less than 10 kilo electron volts? Another thing we don't see is an overwhelming preponderance of helium-3 uh, in, uh, in um, if uh, hy fusion of hydrogen isotopes was occurring. The reason for that is this re the reason for that is this reaction is extremely probable. In fact, it's, it's many orders of magnitude more probable than the generally accepted, generally accepted propo uh, historically proposed fusion of two deuterons. They're very similar. We get helium in both cases, helium-3 in this case, helium-4 in this case. But this one, because of the very light proton, if it has to tunnel through a Coulomb barrier, it doesn't matter what the distance is, it's going to be many, many orders of magnitude more probable. For example, in a hydrogen molecule, it'll be about 25 orders of magnitude more probable. It's an enormous amount. We expect helium-3 to be the dominating um, product. And this was uh, realized way back in 1989 by the Nobel Prize winner, what's his name? Teller, wasn't it? Swinger, Swinger, sorry, Pinky Barton, sorry, thank you. So I'm going to uh, look at some real theories now, um, three rather different theories, but they're reasonably um, long-standing. Uh, they all have uh, some criticisms which can be made, and I would like to compare and contrast these three. So the widdham larsen theory, the deep Dirac level theory, and the exotic neutral particle theories. Okay, under the widdham larsen theory, we have the, the idea that somehow, uh, somehow, I must, I must say, I don't really explain it, my, uh, uh, understand it myself, uh, electrons are conjectured to acquire energy. Sufficient heavy, sufficiently heavy electrons, uh, with enough energy, can be captured by protons to become neutrons, and perhaps by deuterons but to become di-neutrons, who knows? Um, and the neutral ne neutrons are able to penetrate any Coulomb barrier because, of course, they're neutral. Okay, so we've overcome the Coulomb barrier problem. Um, 
But we don't, we don't understand, therefore, why we don't get 14.1 MeV neutrons. Now, why do I say that? Because a neutron will react with lithium, which is very frequently present in an electrolytic cell, and it's also now been used in the nickel-hydrogen uh, gas-loading experiments. So why don't we get 14.1 MeV uh, uh, neutrons? And the answer is, we don't get enough neutrons. In other words, the neutron idea must be wrong. And uh, the shielding of, of the expected gammas by these so-called heavy electrons must be wrong as well, because a neutron will come out. If the neutrons have got to see any shielding, the neutron will just diffuse uh, anywhere in your equipment. So we don't see any of this. So I don't like this, I don't like this theory. Okay, I think I've gone ahead of myself a little bit. One good thing, however, is that uh, electron capture by helium-3, we've got some heavy electrons now, ought to produce tritium at very low energy. This is an, exos an endothermic reaction. So we just had a, a small number of electrons at, at lowish energy. We might get some tritium and explain that the, uh, the low energy tritium. Now, before we, uh, the, the energy required by the heavy electron in order to uh, be captured by a proton has a, a threshold of 780 kilo electron volts. But long before that electron is raised up to such an energy, it's, it's uh, going to be able to react with a good 65 of the 287 naturally occurring isotopes. In other words, it'll react with um, helium-3, of course. No, I haven't got the examples. Uh, 65 is a large number. I don't think they would fit on a slide. But if anyone wants to know how to do this calculation, if they come to the back, I will show them on the computer. Okay, I think I've covered that point already. Okay, the next theory I'm going to look at is the, uh, the deep Dirac level theory of uh, um, Andrew Muhlenberg and Jean-Luc Jean um, Bayet. Um, this is a much better theory, in my opinion. Why? Because uh, uh, we can suppress the, the Coulomb barrier by screening the proton or the deuteron with, a, with, a, with an electron. And the notation used by these um, gentlemen are um, that, uh, that H, um, how do you say that uh, character in English? Okay, 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 is this. So that, that really means a mini atom of hydrogen or a mini atom of deuterium. And to all intents and purposes, it's effectively neutral, certainly not chemically reactive, and uh, it, it can get that it can diffuse close to a, any nucleus and possibly react with it. In fact, it's very likely to react with it because almost every um, uh, nucleus, in, natural nucleus, um, can have an exothermic reaction with one of these entities. So this suggests there could be an awful lot of residual radioactivity. I will come into that in a minute. Um, when the uh, fusion reaction occurs, and we have an electron very close to the fusing nuclei, that electron itself could carry off the energy. And so we neatly solve the problem with this theory of suppressing gamma, penetrating gamma radiation. So it looks like we, with exactly the same mechanism, we have solved the Coulomb barrier problem and we have solved the, uh, the lack of penetrating radiation. Thank you. I'm going to need one, I can tell you. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, does anyone, by the way, have any objections to what I've said so far? No, I, I, before you forget, um, uh, uh, you, you, uh, if you object to any points, do, do feel free to interrupt me. Okay. You should, but that depends on the nature of the material through which the electrons are passing. If they pass through lead, you could get some lethal x rays. Of, the Bremsstrahlung radiation of, of, of 100 kev. But if you're passing them through heavy water or some glass, probably the radiation is not going to escape. You won't notice it. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think this is 
So far, this is quite a good theory. We haven't found any major flaws in it, but we'll see. Okay, let's look at what I call a reasonable subset of what's going to happen with a proton interaction with a, nucle a naturally occurring nucleus in your, in, your, in your setup. So we have uh, a deep Dirac level um, hydrogen atom here. As I say, it's neutral, it can go anywhere. And it interacts with a generic um, naturally occurring isotope. And of course, the um, reaction expected is uh, effectively a change in charge of the nucleus, becomes more positive, becomes heavier, and uh, the electron is free to carry off the energy. Now the question is, of these products, which ones are going to be radioactive? We've got 287 naturally occurring isotopes, and I want to know does this theory predict radioactivity? Because if it, if we... Sorry. Um, that's absolutely fine, and the same general principles um, apply to deuterium. In fact, deuterium makes the situation worse. So I'm making, I'm taking the uh, the, 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 either, the better alternative. Okay, you're quite, you're quite right. Yes. Um, this could, this could be a, a, a D hash or whatever. Well, here are some, are some examples of, of proton activation, and we get, um, not surprisingly, some positron emitting um, products because we've added positive charge to the, to the nucleus. And fluorine 17, fluorine 18, copper 59. Uh, in, 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 uh, so the first two, obviously, the oxygen in the, in the heavy water or the light water okay, can react. In the nickel system, we expect uh, uh, copper 59, which has a, a half-life of a couple of hours, I think. Um, silver in the, in the palladium system. In other words, virtually every common system uh, that we're typically used in cold fusion experiments predicts um, residual radiation if this theory is correct. Now, uh, Andrew Muhlenberg has some things to say about this, but even he admits that there's a problem. Anyway, um, Andrew Muhlenberg, who's in, uh, is it India, um, saw my presentation on the web and he made some comments. And here are his comments. He says, the direct weak interaction, I, um, a proton and an electron plus oxygen 16 would go to oxygen 17. Oxygen 17, of course, is stable. And so he thinks he's resolved the problem. The trouble here is we have to have a simultaneous strong interaction of the proton with the, with the oxygen-16 nucleus, and uh, that has to, be, has, has to coincide with the electron capture. Well, there are two problems with this. The first is the, uh, the electron capture is a weak interaction, so typically 28 orders of magnitude slower than the strong one, so that there's no chance that they can both happen at the same time, because one of these as I say, 28 orders of magnitude faster. Second problem is we've consumed the electron, which would be carrying off the energy. So we get a very strong gamma if this were occurring. Unless, of course, the neutrino carries off the energy, in which case we don't get any heat. So whatever solution you try and find, you haven't solved the problem. However, uh, things get even worse. Um, because sometimes you get a whole chain of uh, radioactive decays. So uh, a proton and, uh, and palladium could produce silver. The silver uh, would decay to uh, palladium, and the palladium would then decay to rhodium. So we have a whole chain, a radioactive chain. We can't expect some magical interaction to uh, interact with uh, part, uh, an arbitrary particle down the chain. So we, we would expect to see prodigious gamma radiation. So at this point, I ask, my, I, I ask the more generic question, why is it that uh, all these reactions with deuterons or protons produce radio, uh, residual radioactivity? Why is radioactivity so common? Because if we can find out the key to this, we might be able to find a model which does not predict residual radioactivity. And the answer really is that uh, um, the average binding energy of a nucleus is around 
six to nine million electron volts per nucleon. That's a lot of energy. So basically, just a proton or a neutron being captured by a, a, a stable nucleus will produce that much energy. That is so energetic that the product is likely to be in, a, in a, um, an excited state or it will fragment into uh, particles with other excited states, maybe with the emission of a, uh, an alpha or something like that. So what we need really is um, a mechanism which is much gentler, which doesn't add 8 million electron volts. If you can find a series of, of nuclear reactions uh, of, this, of this kind, then perhaps we've got a, an answer. So I uh, compared the <coughs> what happens to with an interaction of a neutron, a proton, a deuteron, an etzion, and an an anion, uh, those are these last two uh, uh, these. This is um, uh, Yuri Barzhutov's notation, but I'm, what I'm about to say applies equally to John Fisher's polyneutrons. Okay. Uh, the etzion theory and the polyneutron theory were born about 25 years ago, and more or less they've survived, though I think they haven't been properly criticized. I think this is probably the first presentation ever where they've been uh, criticized. Uh, I rather like the theories because they're quite elegant, but we'll see even these have some defects. Anyway, the, the extraordinary thing is, when we look at the, the 287 naturally occurring isotopes, neutrons, um, uh, and I say, not only, uh, I'm look, I only to, to cut down the numbers, I looked at spin and parity con conserving uh, reactions only, because they are the most probable. Nevertheless, we still get 23 capture reactions of neutrons, which produce residual beta radioactivity. Protons are much the same. Deuterons are far worse, not surprisingly, because deuteron, is going, when it's captured, is going to produce a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of extra binding. And we've got two nucleons um, joining the, uh, the target nucleus. And the extraordinary thing was, when I did this uh, calculation, that the etzions produced no radioactivity whatsoever, and the anions only produced two radioactive uh, products in the case of um, neutrons transfer to the, uh, the target. And I thought, as there are only two, I've quoted the, um, the two of them, chlorine 36 and rubidium 86. Um, I don't know why it is, but in um, Ed Storms' book, uh, he says chlorine should not be used in the electrolyte but we all know also that Mel Miles has been successfully using chlorine. And um, I don't know uh, to what extent the electrolyte has ever been analyzed to see if it's radioactive or not. However, chlorine-36 um, has a half-life of 301,000 years. Only 0.03% of, the, of the, those decays produce gammas. And the gammas are uh, annihilation reactions of positrons, which are so generic, no one would think it came from... Uh, chlorine 36. So it would be very difficult to assign uh, the, the source of such radioactivity. In other words, it doesn't really tell us very much about the, uh, the underlying nuclear reaction. In contrast, however, um, I think it was uh, 1993, Bush and Eagleton at uh, Pomona University, is that right? Um, uh, I measured excess heat, uh, isotopic anomalies, and uh, gamma radioactivity in the electrolysis of rubidium carbonate on a, a nickel cathode and a platinum anode. And as I've got, there's a very short poster of mine here trying to replicate this experiment, because I think it's absolutely fundamental. Remember, out of the 287 naturally occurring isotopes, rubidium is the one which is going to produce radioactivity, only one. And lo and behold, that radioactivity was discovered 25 years ago. The only problem is, as I say, the replication did not produce any radioactivity. But maybe I did something wrong. Um, the the, the um, Barshutov and Fischer theories, which I call exotic nuclear particle theories, uh, arbitrarily um, explain the tritium at low, at low energy by saying that, by saying that uh, the masses, the difference in mass between these two coincides with the very low energy for this reaction. I think this is a rather unsatisfactory 
um, explanation. It's an ad hoc explanation, rather like the explanation of, of Widerman Larson, who say heavy electrons can shield. You know, we just invent um, parameters without any scientific um, support. So I don't know how tritium is formed. Uh, all I can say is I could pose it as a problem which theory should address. It's quite possible, uh, maybe uh, Tom Clayton can advise us, that what is measured as tritium is not tritium at all. And so we're looking in the wrong direction. Maybe it's just a, some, other, some other beta decay. So my feelings still remain that the ENP theories uh, initially proposed by Fisher and Bajutov uh, are quite good. I think the details are completely wrong because I haven't looked into the, uh, haven't explained here the, um, the other reactions which create problems there. And in fact, my, my um, <laughs> idea is to take the subset which does work. So for example, I don't believe John Fisher's polyneutrons are correct because if a polyneutron were to be floating around in some heavy water, it would grow indefinitely and we don't see um, the water boiling away. Similarly, I don't believe in, uh, in Bajutov's um, uh, Etzion theory because the negative Etzion would behave like a, a negative muon and catalyze hot fusion and we don't see the hot fusion products. These are really such elementary observations. I'm, I'm quite surprised that uh, the authors haven't addressed them, but I think this really is, boils down to the, uh, well, what uh, David Nagel said about uh, the authors having difficulty uh, understanding what their own theories predict. So thank you very much.